The Word of God tells me to forgive when somebody speaks evil against me or somebody does me wrong, but the Word of God tells me to forgive. What do my emotions tell me to do? My emotions tell me to strike back. My emotions tell me to get revenge. This is what the world tells me to do and what my flesh tells me to do. But the Word of God protects me from making a horrible mistake. We are in Psalms 119, and we're going to look at verses 89 through 96. Now, if you were with us last week, you remember that we looked at 81 through 88. And 81 through 88 is the darkest part of this psalm. It is the middle of the psalm, and it is also the darkest part. And the psalmist is in a really bad place, and he's really struggling. And it is interesting to me that when he is at his darkest moment, Uh, what then comes next is he chooses to emphasize and focus on the Word of God. And that's really what all eight of these verses are about. Every one of these little sections of Scripture, uh, which are the Hebrew alphabet kind of laid out, but every one of these sections of Scripture, the theme is the Word of God. That's what this entire chapter is about. But this section in particular focuses on why the Word of God is so relevant to even today. So I believe that the Bible is the greatest book that was ever written, and I also believe that it is the most relevant book uh, that has stood the test of time. And, and it is as relevant today as when it was written by, uh, by the 40 different authors that wrote the Word of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it was, it was relevant 4,000 years ago, and it's relevant today, and it'll be relevant forever. Um, and this, this psalm talks a lot about that. And, he's, and so there are four reasons why that I believe that the Word of God is relevant today and why I believe, why I believe that it is the greatest book ever. Let's begin reading in, in 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances, for all are your servants. So number one, the reason why it's the greatest book ever is because God's word is permanent. God's word is permanent. Jesus said this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So when we are engaged with God's word, when we are reading God's word, when we are are understanding the principles in God's word, we are not reading something that uh, will be here today and gone tomorrow. It is something that we, we are engaged with that will last forever, okay? So God's word is... Permanent. Now, what he does here is he says, he talks about the creation of God. He he compares the word of God to the creation of God. And there is a certain permanence or consistency to creation. For example, um, as long as I have been alive, and as long as I'm sure most of you have been alive, the sun has risen in the east and set in the west. Am I correct? So, So if you come to the church and you want to see a beautiful sunrise, then you go to the top of this hill and you be here whatever time the sun comes up. (laughs) Anyway, so um, Jeff sees it every day. I do not. I'm not that dedicated. So, um, but he, one of the things that Jeff will do is he'll come here early and he'll set out in his car and he'll watch the sun come up. and, And he knows which direction to face his car, Right? He's not like, hey, where? This is coming from a different direction. It's, he, it always rises in the east. There's a consistency about it, and it sets in the west. So when, so when I choose to enjoy the creation of God, I like seeing the thing go down. So I'm on the backside of our house and can look out to the west and watch the sunset. And there's a beauty about that and the redness of the, of the, of the sky and the clouds, there's a consistency there. there it, it, it doesn't change. Creation doesn't change. It's the same, all right? If I was to walk off this stage, um, gravity would happen. I would fall. I'm 
being held up by these very well-built, by this very well-built stage. I watched this stage get built. I was like, make it as sturdy as possible because we want to put a lot of things up here, and this is a very well-built stage. So this stage is holding me up, but if I was to take a step off of there, what would happen? Gravity would happen. If you took water and you stuck it outside and it was below freezing, it would not boil. It would harden. It would freeze. Nature is consistent. Why is it consistent? Because God made it. So what he's saying here is, he's he's saying the word of God forever is settled in heaven. So there are certain things in our life that are permanent. And the word of God is as permanent as creation. You don't wonder about whether or not it will happen. It will. So just as you don't You don't go to bed at night and go, boy, I sure hope the sun comes up in the east tomorrow. It happens. You don't go to bed at night and go, boy, I sure hope the word of God is true tomorrow. You don't have to wonder about that. You know it's going to happen, okay? And that's what the psalmist is trying to say. This is why it's the greatest book ever. Because philosophies change, but the word of God is permanent. And, you know, I I like this this illustration of that, you know, when, 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 fly, when, when a pilot flies through clouds or fog, uh, which prevent them from seeing the horizon, pilots can feel the plane's wings begin to bank to the left or to the right. In fact, in the early days of flight, pilots followed the myth of instinct. They believed that they could feel the turn, and when, when their planes were accidentally engulfed in fog or clouds, many banked unknowingly into a spiral dive that ended in a crash. Because why? They were following their feelings. So this instrument was created. And in fact, one pilot said, instinct is worse than useless in the clouds. And there's something beautiful about, you know, flying through the clouds, and it's particular if it's been in, you've been in Kansas for a while, and it's and it's in the middle of the winter, and you haven't seen a lot of sun, and there's something beautiful about going through those clouds and then getting above the clouds and seeing the sun, you know? And, and so, but, but for a pilot, the clouds are very disorienting. They can be a problem. And, and so what they did is they created this instrument. Uh, to fly through the clouds, pilots must rely on instruments like the artificial horizon. The artificial horizon is something that has a steady line that stays level with the Earth's surface and unerringly indicates when the wings are banked left or right. The artificial horizon revolutionized flying, but when it was first invented, pilots resisted using it. The biggest problem flyers had was belief. They trusted their feelings more than the instruments. And this is where a lot of people get in a lot of trouble because we have feelings. We feel things, and we trust our feelings more than we trust the Word of God. And this is a mistake. We must be like pilots when we fly through the clouds and we feel that the plane is doing something. Let's trust our instruments, which is the Word of God, rather than what we feel, because our feelings may cause us to no dive and lead to our death. And so we are blessed to have the Word of God because the Word of God is permanent. In the Christian life, God's word acts as our primary flight instrument. Our feelings can mislead us, but God's word tells us the truth. The whole world will change, but the permanence of the word of God allows us to steady ourselves when everything else seems to be spinning out of control. And that's what the psalmist is saying here about, and this is why it's the greatest book, because God's word is permanent. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Number two, the second thing that's, that makes the Bible such an incredibly great book is that God's word protects. And we see that in verse 92. Unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction. So unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction. Now, I think this is an interesting line. I want to talk about the first part of that verse, unless your law had been my delight. One of the mistakes I think that we make in life is that we read the Word of God, we spend time in the Word of God in in a crisis mode. And my challenge for you and my challenge for all of us is we need to make the Word of God our delight, and we need to spend time in it every day even when we feel good and there's no problems in our life. 
Because what happens is, it's like when you're in crisis mode trying to find an answer from the Word of God. But if I make the Word of God my delight, and I spend time in it every day, when the crisis comes, then I will have hid the Word of God in my heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this, but this is, I think, a mistake a lot of Christians make, is that they, don't, they neglect the Word of God, and then the, the ship is going down, and they're trying to read the instruction manual. That's, that's the wrong time. You need it before that. All right? So the word of God, though, is what protects. So he says, unless the word of God had been my, unless your law had been my delight, I would have then perished in my affliction. So God's word is an anchor when the storms of life are hitting against us. Just like I compared the Word of God to instruments for a pilot. It is the anchor. The Word of God gives us something to hang on to when our world is falling apart. So Karen and I have been on one cruise. We went on one cruise when there was a tropical storm in the Gulf. Who is the idiot that does that? Well, this idiot, okay? But we got out into the Gulf and, and we were going to have a rough night, and they dropped the anchor. And this powerful anchor, you know, I've watched it go down into the water. They dropped the anchor and settled for the night because we didn't know what the night would bring. Needless to say, slept with one eye open that night. And I was hoping that that anchor was secure in that boat. Well, this is the great thing about the Word of God. The Word of God is our anchor. And it is, the, it is the anchor that we can lean against and hold on to when the storms of life are hitting against us. So when I'm going through a difficult time, what can I take refuge in? That all things work together for good to those who love God, right? So I have these events happening in my life that I don't understand, but God's going to take these events and work them out for his good and his glory, and he is at work in my life, and he has not abandoned me, and where do I find that? In the word of God. So that the word of God protects me, because what happens is, is when I'm afflicted, I want to do what is different than what the word of God says. So the word of God tells me to forgive when somebody uh, uh, speaks evil against me, or somebody does me wrong, but the word of God tells me to forgive. What do my emotions tell me to do? My emotions tell me to strike back. My emotions tell me to get revenge. This is, what the word of, this is what the world tells me to do and what my flesh tells me to do. But the word of God protects me from making a horrible mistake. Isn't that what our whole sermon series has been the last three weeks, really, as we've walked through 1 Samuel 25? And that is that Abigail shows up and she, and she says to David, look, you will regret this for the rest of your life. This is not God's plan. God has a better plan for you. Do what God wants you to do. Forgive this man and move on with your life. And man, she, uh, her counsel saved David's life. Because what did David want to do? David wanted to take Nabal's life, but, but the word of God, in a sense, protected him. And he didn't have that hanging over his head. And the word of God does the same for us. When I react not based on what I want to do, but what the Word of God tells me to do, then it brings me protection. The Word of God protects. This is why it's the greatest book. It keeps us out of a lot of trouble. I'll tell you this. I've never had anybody come to me in 20-some years of pastoring and have somebody say, you know what, I did exactly what the Bible says, and I have a huge regret. Shouldn't have done that. It was a big mistake. But I... It's in the hundreds of people that are coming. You know, I, man, I, I, shouldn't, I knew I shouldn't have got too close to that person at work, and I knew I shouldn't have done that, and I, I knew I shouldn't have said that. And how, Pastor Mark, can you help me kind of walk out of this? It's always better to do what the Word of God says to begin with, right? Are you with me? God's Word protects. And if we'll just do what it says, it will protect us uh, in life, it will protect us from making horrible decisions. It will protect us. Boy, if we just do what the Bible says with our tongue, wouldn't we stay out of a whole lot of trouble? If we just do what the Bible says in regard to how we use our tongue, boy, it'd it protect us. But man, we open our mouths and we get in trouble because we, we say what we, 
We say what we want to feel. We say what we feel. We, we, we get it off our chest. Not always the best thing. But if we do what God's Word says, we hide God's Word in our heart, we study what the Scripture says, we live according to the principles of the Word of God, and, and we follow it, then it'll protect us from a whole lot of trouble. Number three, the third thing the psalmist is saying, why this book is so great, is God's word is powerful. Verse 93, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me, but I will consider your testimony. So God's word is powerful for a couple of reasons. One, It will bring life. It will bring life. What what did, um, you know, I think of Peter when he was, uh, when when he was talking to the Lord and and, and the Lord, there there were many people leaving Jesus and Jesus looked at uh, Peter and he looked at the disciples and he said, will you also go away? And Peter said, Lord, why would we leave you? You have the words of everlasting life. Because what, was the word, what was the word of God in a sense? Um, What was Jesus, I mean? Jesus, John described him as the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us, right? So Jesus was the word of God in the flesh. So what he said was truth. What he says was the word of God. So it is in the words of God that I find that, that uh, I find life. And that's what he's saying. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. So how does a person go from being dead to having everlasting life? Through reading the word of God, through reading the words of Christ, for believing what it says, and we go from death to life. We don't go from death to life by being a better person. We don't go from death to life by doing good works. We go from death to life by reading the word of God, by having somebody show it to us, and by us believing in it, and then in doing so, we have everlasting life. That's that's power. The most powerful reason why I believe in Uh, the word of God and in Jesus Christ and in Christianity is because of how it changes lives. It takes people that are radically this way and they are completely transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit of God. So God's word is powerful. This is why we emphasize the word of God here. There's, there's, I have no power in and of myself But if I stand here and say, thus says the Lord, there's power in the word of God. So all I'm giving you if I'm preaching uh, that's not in the word of God is just advice. But when I give you the words of God, I am giving you an opportunity to have life and have it more abundantly, right? So that's power. God's word is powerful. So he says, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Do you remember the day you got saved? Do you remember the day that your eyes were open to the fact that you're a sinner and in need of a Savior, and Jesus Christ was that Savior, and Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and gave his life for you? Boy, what a powerful moment, huh? How did that come? Through the Word of God. Through the Word of God. The word of God has power that can change us. And that's why the psalmist said, I'll never forget your precepts. I am yours. Save me, he says, for I have sought your precepts. I have sought, uh, uh, in verse 94, the verb sought out means to consult, to inquire, to beat a path, to to read repeatedly. Here is a believer who beats a path to the Bible to read it over and over. He studied it. And when he had made a decision, when when he had to make a decision, he consulted it carefully. Because why is this so important? Because philosophies change. Political expedients fail. Promises and contracts are broken. But the word of God still stands. 
God's word is powerful. It will bring life and it will, it will help us make decisions that are beyond our years because we have, we have trusted in what God's word says. And then the last verse tells us that God's word is perfect. Now, the New King James reads this way. He says, I, it says, I have seen the consummation of all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. I can be a little bit confusing. I like the English Standard Version a little better. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. And what he's saying is, all human philosophies are finite, limited, and inadequate. But the Word of God gives us an adequate view of life and death, time and eternity. It gives us strength for living, grace for dying, and hope for eternity. So the Word of God is perfect. You know, I think that, I think that men have come up with some really good forms of things, but nothing man has come up with is perfect. You know, our, our rule of law, so to speak, in our, our government is a pretty good form of government. Um, but what are we, 200-something years in? I know we're over 200. And, it's, and, and you can, you're, you're beginning to see uh, some of the flaws or some of the problems with this form of government. Right? Because initially you got a, a country that's governed by a bunch of people that love God. What happens to this form of government when you have a whole bunch of people who don't care about God? So, so as good as the founders were, you, I... I I'm, I'm, I'm going to be careful here because it ticks people off when I say this, but as good as the founders were, they did not create a perfect document. The Constitution is not a perfect document. The Word of God is. And we should run to the Word of God and lean on it more than we run to the Constitution and lean on it. Because the Word of God is perfect. God's word is perfect. Not down on the Constitution. I'm grateful for the Constitution. Pastor Mark is anti-Constitution. No, I'm grateful for our country, and I'm grateful for that. But, but it's just people will defend the Constitution and will say nothing about the word of God, and that's, that's not right. Because the word of God is perfect, and it helps me in every aspect of my life. So that's what the psalmist is trying to say, he says, I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Man, it, it, it covers all of my life, not just part of my life. And it, is, and it is perfect counsel and perfect advice in everything I do. So you hold in your hands <clears throat> or on your tablet, you hold in your hands the greatest book ever. Why? Because it's the Word of God. And what makes it so great? Well... It is what? It is permanent. Heaven and earth will pass away. This will never pass away. It is, it protects me. Well, there's a lot of things I want to do. And the word of God has kept me out of a lot of trouble. How about you? Could we not have testimonies all night about, well, I'm sure glad I did what the Bible said rather than what I wanted to do. It is great because it is powerful. You know what I think the hope for the world is? Jesus Christ. I think the hope for the world is found in the contents of this book. And why do I believe that? Because I believe that uh, this book can change a world. And I believe uh, this book can change me. Powerful. 
And I'm, I'm, it's the greatest book ever because it's perfect. People have tried to destroy it. Was it Voltaire who said in 50 years, I will have banished the Bible from the earth? Voltaire died. The book still is here. So it's the greatest book ever. And I'm grateful that we get to hold a copy of it in our hands and on our tablets and on our phones. And we get to read it and spend time in it. I hope you understand how blessed we are to hold this book. So let's make sure we get in it every day because in it we learn the words of life, all right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you for, for letting me live in a place where I can read it freely. I think of the video I saw the other day about a country that had, didn't have the word of God and, they, and, and believers were getting a copy of it for the first time and the joy that they had just tears running down their face Lord we have so many copies of it in our lives and homes and we just take it for granted but Lord I pray we wouldn't take your word for granted Where would we be without the Word of God? So thank you so much for it. Thank you for giving us hope for the future in your Word. Thank you that we can speak with confidence that heaven is our home because we, we read about it in your Word. And we can, have, we can be encouraged even when we're going through trials because your Word says that you're working things out. And even when we feel alone, We know that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you for all your word is. We're grateful for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.